Today I want to preach, if you'll give me just a few minutes this morning, I'm going to continue my series on the next step, your next step. And if you will, I want you to think about this, your next step, the first step we talked about was your first step with your experience and relationship with Jesus Christ. As Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, God transformed him, changed him, and he was delivered, and God changed and transformed who he was. He was no longer the same. He became different. He took a different step. And then the Bible tells us, and we read on, and, and wh what your next step would be. Paul went to ministry. He went to the challenges of ministering to those that are around him. You see, all of us, we can take that first step, but if we quit after our first step, we're not getting anywhere. Amen? If you only took one step today, how far would you be? Not very far, right? One step. I don't care how long a legs you got or how big a step you can take. One step won't get you very far. So you need to take one step. And I know that there's an old Christmas song that says, take one step, put one foot in front of the other, and soon you'll be walking out the door. Some of you haven't watched a Christmas show in a long time. But if you learn to take just one step after another step. You see, today I'm going to talk to you about what's the next step. What's your next step? You see, I believe that every one of us need to realize that God has done a work and begun a good work in us so that we can be an example for someone else. Amen? He didn't save you just so you could keep from going to hell. He saved you so you could tell somebody else that wouldn't go to hell. Amen? And the purpose and the work of what God has done in us is to make disciples. You see, in the great commission that he gives us in Matthew, the 28th chapter, in verse 19, he says that we are to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen? Now, I thought about that, and I began to think about the idea of what that truly means to make disciples. You see, we've done a lot of evangelism. We go knocking on doors. We talk to people. We see them saved. But are we seeing them grow in Christ? Are we seeing them become disciples? From the first of the year, I begin to talk about the nature of growth and what God wants us to do. You see, God doesn't start something in us that He doesn't want to finish. God has a work that He has for each of us. And God has a purpose and a plan for all of us. He said that we are to grow into and make disciples. He said, go therefore and make disciples. He didn't say, go therefore and evangelize. He said, go and make disciples. So I thought about this and I said, well, the problem with the world is, is maybe they don't understand exactly what it means to be a disciple. So the definition of being a disciple is very simple. Defining discipleship. Someone who adheres to the teachings of another. It is a follower or a learner. It refers to someone who takes up the way of someone else. And I begin to think about that, and truly that is what we are when we take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. When we start this path, we become a follower of Jesus Christ, and we begin to follow Him. A discipler is one who takes that person that follows them and takes them under their wing and guides them and directs them. We should re be reproducing someone after what God has brought us through. Has anybody ever been through a problem in your life? You've been in a battle. You know that God doesn't bring you into a battle except to use you for his glory in it. So that you can tell others about what God has done. Next, we realize that God speaks to us in so many different ways about our discipleship and what discipleship truly is. To be a learner, to be someone who is a student, to study and to know and to be trained. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, Paul says this. He says, therefore... Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Give no offense uh, uh, either to the Jew or to the Greek or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Now this is the part that I want you to catch. Chapter 11, starting that very first verse, he says... Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. The role of us as a disciple in a discipling church, you see, I don't believe that we are just called to do our church stuff, come in, check in, check out, and say we've done our church stuff. 
Here's what I'm going to tell you something. I believe that our goal should be to reproduce Christ in someone else that Christ is doing in us. We are a work that Christ has transformed and changed us. It's a testimony. Come on. Some of you, if, if we knew what you were like before you met Christ, we would be scared to death of you. Come on. Some of you, I'm almost scared of you now. But because of the encounter that you had in Christ and because of what Christ has done in your life, we are transformed. We are a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. What I used to be is not what I am. Some of you, you've known me for a long time, but you don't know everything about what I used to be. Some of you, I've told enough stories, you, you know a little bit about me. Believe it or not, Brother Farr, I was n not as good as I am today. I used to be, be a little ornery, a little mischievous. And because my dad and mom are probably watching this live streaming, I wasn't that bad. But I wasn't that good. But there was a time when I would say, don't do what I do because I know it's not right. Anybody there? Sometimes we got to be careful and say, don't follow me because what I'm doing is not what I need to do. Uh, Charles Barkley one time was interviewed and they said, Charles, how do, you, how do you think about, what do you think about being an example to the young people of this world? And he said, I don't want to be an example because I don't want anybody to make the same mistakes I made. We learn to go forward based upon our experiences. And sometimes we think that we have to experience the problems of the world to grow forward. But actually what we do is we learn from other mistakes of other people so that we can grow forward and don't have to make those same mistakes. Come on. I mean, I just looked at this and I, I thought about the idea. That's why when Paul was writing here to the church at Corinth, he began to write to them, and told them, he says, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or a Greek. It doesn't matter if you're part of the church. It doesn't matter about all those things. It doesn't matter. Listen, if you're doing it to get a pat on the back or money from it, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. But if you're doing it to please God, be an example for Him, God will bless and honor your life. Not because you're good enough, not because you earn it, but because God is good enough. The Bible tells us that Saul, when we were talking last week, we left Saul off where he had spent some time with the disciples, and there were those who wanted to persecute Saul. Saul, in his transformation, he learns from the disciples. He spent time with the disciples. In Acts, the ninth chapter, in verse 19, after Paul had met his conversion in Damascus, and he had been transformed, and he went and preached the gospel, he spent some time with the disciples there in Damascus. And I will tell you this, and I want you to hear me. Not everybody's going to like the change you make. Not everybody's going to like who you are and what you have become. They're still going to find, they're still going to look at you and think, well, you're just the same person. You're just trying to cover up your bad side. Come on. Most of the time, how many of you realize it's your family that's the last to realize you really made the change? Because they saw you what you used to be. They knew what you used to be. And they're still looking at you thinking you're still that same person. You're just trying, come on. Put a little lipstick on a pig, maybe. <laughs> trying to make yourself, trying to make the, the image of who you are and what you are to cover up the mistakes. But I will tell you something. I know that I made mistakes, and I'll be the first to admit that I made mistakes from my past. But thank God I'm a new creature. Thank God I'm changed. Thank God I'm not what I used to be. Thank God that he started me on a path to change my life. And I still have people that look at me and say, I know you when you used to be. And I said, yes, but I used to be, but I'm no more. Mm-hmm, come on. When I look at this, I see that Paul, or Saul, as he was preaching there, he began to preach, and, and he was preaching around, among the disciples, and he spent time among the disciples. Now, I will tell you this. That's why we promote and talk about being in a church. It, it, the, the problem with a lot of people is, is that they're all about coming to church so they can get your money. That's not it. The purpose of the church is to teach and to train. While you're here, we hope that you get something that you can take home so you can share it with somebody else. We hope that you get something in your spirit that makes you transform. Somebody in your life gave an example for you to see and said, that's what I want to be. 
I think Hal's hiding back there because he knew I was going to use him today as an example. DJ, you remember when I used to sit in the front row at the Chandler Church. Chris, you guys remember this? And Hal would sit here. Your lovely daughter would sit beside him. And they would sit there and Hal would wear his nice suit. He's shaking his head. He said, please, Pastor, don't go there. He was about, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years old. He'd look up at me and, and he would say, and, 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 and he would say, one day I'm going to be just like you. I'm praying he goes bald soon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. When, I, when he looked up at me, he said, I want to be, and I, it thrilled me when he came to me and he said, Pastor, I, I, I want to learn from you. I want to learn from you. And I said, how? I'll put everything I can into teaching you. Some of it you just got to go through and learn. You know, he told me yesterday, he said, Pastor, I'm so glad that I'm at your church because you have so many people that I can learn from. So many of our men yesterday just being an example of a godly man and being an example of what godly men are like. Being able to see that, but, you know, I used to think, you know, how it's such a, it's such a privilege that you would say you'd want to be like me and I would get up and I'd start preaching and I wouldn't much more than grab the mic and start talking that I'd look over and Hal is asleep in the front row. I'd say, well, sooner or later, it's going to get him. So, uh, but I thank God because of the fact that he wanted to spend time. And, and uh, the thing is, is if you want to truly change, you don't have a one-time encounter with God and then walk away from him and expect to truly transform. Saul spent time in Damascus with the disciples. You need to run of elbows with other believers so that we can have fellowship with one another. That's why in Matthew or Hebrews, the, 25th, or the 10th chapter and verse 25, it says not to neglect the gathering of the saints together as some are accustomed to. I can tell you this. There are a lot of people uh, that, that, that are neglecting the gathering of the church. We need it. Amen. I loved what Brother Ken had to share yesterday when he was testifying of just his experiences. We've had others of you that, that have stood up and shared your testimony. You've given your, your testimony on the, the second Saturday of every month. Turn to one guy and say, in the second Saturday of every month, I'm looking for you next week. So Martin doesn't have to do the dishes next week. Come next, next the, first, the second Saturday, next month. If you come, my breakfast is free and yours is too. All right. Amen. Here's what I'm going to tell you something is, if, you, if you'll come, the second thing is, is that you're just looking at a bunch of folks in this room right here that are trying to do their best to follow Jesus Christ. When I was looking around that room, I was looking at the guys. We had, I think they counted 26 or something like that yesterday. When I was looking around that room, I found a lot of men that were in the same place I was. They're just following Jesus as best as they can because they knew somebody was following. That's why Paul was bold enough to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Don't follow me because I'm, I'm human. I might make a mistake. Come on. But follow me because I'm following the one who's perfect. Now, here's the discipleship work that we need to do is to begin to grow more in this. Go ahead and pull the next slide up. In Acts, the ninth chapter, a little bit further down, the disciples took him because what Saul was saying, he began to preach it. They didn't like it. They threatened to kill him. They were going to kill Saul because of what he was preaching. And so the disciples took him and they, by night and they, and they let him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. And did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to, his, to the disciples. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and there on the way to Damascus. And he, and he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Here's what I'm going to tell you. If you truly want those around you to know that you've changed, you've got to live it before them. Amen? You don't, you don't, get, a, you don't get an opportunity to, to sometimes get a second chance to be a witness. 
Sometimes it's where you are and what that moment that you have is how you will react to that situation that you find yourself in. To be an example in a crisis or a difficult situation. To be able to say that I trust in God even when I'm struggling. To be able to testify of that is the example that Paul was trying to give. When Paul was here, he was learning from the disciples, but yet the disciples were afraid of him. They didn't trust him. Our purpose as a church is that we must make disciples. We must make disciples that make disciples that make, say it with me, that make disciples. We must make disciples that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. To get the nature of this is it's not about just living so that you don't go to hell. It's so that you can take somebody to heaven with you. Jesus said that his father was saying that I would that none would perish. And that all would come to eternal life. Now I don't know about you, but I don't want anybody to die and go to hell. I don't, I don't want to see it because if you know what hell's like, no one deserves it. Not the hardest of, of, of those that are in the, living in the gutters. Not even those that are they're living in the problems and the sins of this world. They need Jesus Christ. And we must be that extension of Christ to them. And we have to be that example before them. When Bi the Bible tells about us in, in verse 27, it says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the, the, the apostles. Someone grabbed him and said, This is, this is Saul. He's a, he's a little rough around the edges, but he's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's, he's not perfect, but he's a good guy. Come here, Bob. Come on. Marsha, I'm going to borrow him for a minute. <laughs> I can tell you, he's a little rough around the edges, but he's a good guy. I mean, he's a little rough around the edges. He's a little rough from his past. He's a little rough in some things, but I'm going to tell you something. The change that he's made, the testimony of it is, is what I used to be, I'm not anymore. Amen. Amen. And the difference that we make is when we become that witness to say what I used to be, I am not. But I disciple someone. I take someone under my wings and I teach them. He's introduced me to people. Marsha, I know he talks to everybody, doesn't he? Doesn't ever <laughs> shut up. He's a little rough around the edges. A lot rougher around the edges, she says. But every time I meet him, he's bringing somebody new saying, hey, I talked to them. I brought them to the men's breakfast. Now Bob's almost a regular, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he is. He, he loves is. it. He, and he, yeah. and he was there. He was praying. I, I, I look around and I see, you tell me about, well, I met so-and-so. And he used to be a friend. Now I, I'm, he, the other day you told me that you were having a Bible study with, with a couple different guys. From, yeah, at the uh, golf club. And they were a little different, weren't they? Well, yeah, they're golfers. <laughs> <laughs> they were a little rough around the edges. <laughs> A disciple making a disciple. Now, I'll tell you what. I, I, I'm not telling you that I, I'm going to grow up and look like Bob. There's some things to be thankful for. God didn't tell me that I had to grow up and, and look like Brother Bledsoe. But Brother Bledsoe has been a mentor of mine for years. I mean, if, if, if I, I look at him and I say, man, one day I hope I grow up and look just like that. He says, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> you know what? But I see maturity in his life. And I say, Lord, I want to act just like him. Because I see him following Christ. I know he's not perfect. I've played golf with him. I know he's not perfect. <laughs> he's not that good. But there are some things that I see in him. that I And I appreciate it because he takes me by the hand. And he, he was my Barnabas when I was Saul. And he took me by the hand and he said, come on. And, and sometimes we need somebody to take us by the hand and say, come on, you can change. You can do it. Because the world will tell you and others will tell you, you're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to be that good. But I'm going to tell you something. With God's help, he will use you for his purpose and his glory. It doesn't matter what you used to be. You're new in him. Amen. Go ahead. Bring that next one up. 
Our purpose as a church. Disciples making disciples that make disciples. Go ahead. The church's goal cannot be to just evangelize the world. Nor can we just be satisfied only to disciple new believers. We must make disciples that make disciples. We have to. We have a discipleship program that we're going to be starting at the... We've had it ongoing and we start it, we drop it, we start it, we got it. On Sunday nights, we're going to start having it. I want every one of our people to understand this. If you've not been through it, you need to go through it. It starts from the very foundation of your faith in Jesus Christ and goes all the way through knowing your purpose and plugging it in. Somewhere in that level, you are fitting. And if you go through the 400 level and you finish the last level of this thing, then what you need to do, you should be standing up being a discipler, teaching and making disciples. I've told some of you, I said, what you need to do is if, if you've gone through this level and you have grown through this place and you have done this, you should be doing something. You should be taking people home and saying, hey, let's, let's have our discipleship. Start a Wednesday night. So if you, if you can't come on Sunday night, uh, have, have a group of people get together and, and, and do a small group in your home. Do a small group with your family. Get together so that we can evangelize. But the church needs to be making disciples, reproducing the work of Christ. There are church after church after church that come together Sunday after Sunday, rubbing elbows with each other and greeting each other on Sunday morning, but never transforming the life of the believer. God, help us to be a church that transforms people that are lost into the work of God that they need to be. That we are the disciplers. Amen. Every one of us need to have a mentor, but every one of us need to also be mentoring someone behind us. It can be a son or a daughter. Come on. It can be a friend or a family member. It can be someone that God, you take under your wing and, and you begin to love them into the kingdom of God. And you begin to share the love of Christ because whether you realize it or not, someone is looking at you. I had a picture and I was going to put this picture up, but Chuck, I thought it might not be appropriate for church settings. But there's a bunch of sheep and Andrew they're walking down this road there's a ton of sheep they're probably I don't know as wide as the picture was and it says keep your eyes on what's in front of you when you're a sheep and you're following another sheep what are you looking at but they knew it was the <laughs> They knew as long as you were focusing on what's in front of you, you weren't going to go astray. And sometimes we need to keep our eyes upon Christ. You need to focus on that. And then you need to focus on those who are following it. Go ahead and pull that next one up. I'm almost finished. Stay with me. Barnabas stood up for Paul uh, before the disciples. Then Paul stood up for Timothy. And each one of us needs to be looking to mentor someone in the faith. And we also need uh, to have someone to mentor us. You'll never outgrow needing someone in front of you. Come on. You know what Billy Graham used to say? He said, people, because of my experience in the ministry, never thought I needed someone to look to. But in spite of that, I needed to gather others around me that believed so that I could be encouraged. There is never a time that you don't need someone to lead you. You know what happens to a sheep when it run, wanders off, stops looking at what's in front of it? The next thing you know, the wolf finds it, kills it, and destroys it. You have an enemy that right now is waiting for you to wander off and wander off in your own way. And the Bible says he is a, as a lion. Looking whom he may devour. He's looking for that one who wanders away. And wanders out. Because when he gets you alone. He can isolate you. And destroy you. But God says stay with the flock. Stay with the shepherd. And he'll get you through. Amen. Go ahead and pull the next one. We do not meet people by accident. God places these people in our lives for 
a reason. I want you to think about this right now. As the musicians can come right now. I guess just Roberto, you and Naomi can come. But I want you just to bow your heads right now across this place. There are people that you meet in your life. There are people that you meet right now in every day of your life that God is using you to be an example, to guide, to direct, to lead you, and to give you that hope. There are people that you are encountering right now. You didn't plan on it, but God put them there. God has a purpose for that. 